If you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Feel free to use table of contents if you need to. And as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Arlington and Montgomery County, Prince William, Loudon, others online. It's really good to be together around God's Word, knowing that God's Word speaks directly to the deepest needs in our lives. So along those lines, I want to ask you a question. What comes to your mind when you hear the word healing? Maybe to make it even more personal, what kind of healing have you experienced in the past in your life? Or what kind of healing do you desire, maybe long to experience in the present in your life? Maybe physical healing comes to your mind. Maybe you have experienced healing from sickness or a disease in the past. Or maybe you're struggling with a sickness or disease in the present or maybe a disability of some sort, something for which you long to be healed. One of our pastors who struggles with debilitating migraines was up all night last night, just sent me a quick message this morning knowing what we would be talking about today in God's Word. Or maybe when you think of healing, you think of thoughts or emotions. Maybe you struggle with anxiety or depression obsession or other mental illness and you long to be healed for your mind to be free. Maybe you think of emotional hurt that God has brought you through or that you need God to heal you of. Maybe it's relational. You've experienced brokenness in a certain relationship And maybe you've experienced healing and restoration in that relationship. Or maybe you're still waiting for that to happen. Maybe it's bigger than any one relationship. Maybe it's healing in the church. Maybe it's healing in our country, the world around us. You wake up to yet more headlines of shootings, whether in Dallas or Buffalo, and it brings up all kinds of hurts. You long for healing on so many different levels. I just imagine that across this gathering, this room, all the other places where we are gathered right now, there are so many different thoughts and emotions and circumstances and situations that come to our mind when we hear the word healing. And just to let you know where all of this is going today, we're going to land on having some time to pray for healing in all of these ways based upon the beauty of Jesus we're about to see in a story of him healing a blind man. Now, this particular story is unique on multiple levels. One, no other gospel writer tells this story, not Matthew Not Luke, not John, only Mark tells us this story. And there are some details in it that are unlike every other time Jesus heals someone in the Bible. And then on a deeper level, this story is not just about a blind man in need of physical sight. It's about people in need of spiritual sight. Now, we don't have time to cover all of that today. So we're going to save that last part for next week, Lord willing, when we see how this story of physical healing relates to you and me and spiritual sight. But today, I just want us to read this story plainly and think together about the healing touch of Jesus. And not just think about it. We're going to pray for the healing touch of Jesus in each other's lives based on three characteristics of Jesus I want to show you in this story that I would encourage you to write down. 
So start with me in Mark chapter 8, verse 22. Let's just read the story and pause along the way to make sure we're understanding what's happening. Imagine the scene. And the disciples came to Bethsaida. And some people brought to him, him being Jesus, a blind man and begged him to touch him. Now let's stop here and make sure we understand what's happening. We get the scene. We need to realize that people in this day would have thought certain things about this man because he was blind. And not just people out there, but even Jesus' disciples. What would they have been thinking about this man? Because there's a different story about a Another blind man in John chapter 9, listen to how it starts. John chapter 9, verse 1 says, Jesus passed by. He saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Do you see the connection there in people's minds? Blindness was not just a physical Disability. It was a spiritual curse. If you were blind, clearly you had done something wrong, maybe even before you were born. This man or his parents that he was born this way. So the common thought in that day was that disability was connected to sin. Disease connected to sin. As a result, the blind and the deaf and the mute and the lame and the leper, they were all outcasts in society, deemed unclean, unworthy, put out of the synagogue. They were untouchable. Pharisees, Sadducees, rabbis, teachers, they wouldn't touch them. So here comes a group of people in, Ma- in Mark chapter 8, with a blind man begging Jesus to do what? To touch him. And here's the first characteristic I want you to see in Jesus today. I want you to see his tender compassion. Look at what he does. He doesn't just touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Jesus is doing what no other religious leader would do. He takes him by the hand. Like holding somebody else's hand is a pretty personal thing, right? If you're holding somebody's hand right now, that's probably an indicator of a pretty close relationship. I don't think you sat down next to a stranger today and just like, hey, let's hold hands. If so, that was super bold of you and likely awkward for them. This is a very personal thing. And then to continue holding it, as Jesus, picture it, gently guides him through a crowd, around obstacles, helping him know where to step, where not to step, holding him up when he stumbles. And it's worth pausing here to point out that this is how Jesus heals all throughout the Bible, through touch. Turn back with me in your Bible to Mark chapter 1, and I'll I'll have it up here on the screen, but if you have a Bible in front of you, look at it, maybe even underline it, make notes. I want to show you how Jesus does this over and over and over again. In the first chapter, Mark chapter 1, what we read months ago, verse 30, the Bible says, now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately told him about her, and he came and listened to what he did. He took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. He didn't have to do that. He could have looked across the room and said, you're healed. Instead, he goes over, takes her by the hand, and lifts her up. Look down in the same chapter at verse 40. And a leper came to Jesus, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand, and what did he do? He touched him and said to him, I will be clean. Again, he could have just said, I will be clean. You didn't touch lepers. But he reached out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. 
Jump down to chapter 3. Look at this summary statement in verse 10. For Jesus had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. The untouchables knew that Jesus could be touched. Jump down to the crowd gathered in chapter 5. Look at verse 22. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. This dad knew that if Jesus would just lay hands on his dying daughter, she would live. So Jesus heads toward the man's home. And remember what happened along the way? A woman with an issue of blood for 12 years had heard the reports about Jesus, came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. In the next chapter, chapter 6, verse 5, even as Jesus is being rejected in Nazareth, Mark writes, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And then after he touches five loaves of bread and two fish and they multiply into a meal for 5,000 plus people, Listen to how this chapter ends. Mark chapter 6, verse 56. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. Are you getting the picture here? Jesus does not keep his distance from people who need healing. Jesus comes to them. Where others walk away, Jesus walks toward. He pursues them personally, and in tenderness, he touches them. And we, we read this in Hebrews in our church's Bible reading plan just recently. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, one of the classic Bible translations says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses. And when you think about it, this is the essence of who Jesus is, right? Jesus is God in the what? In the flesh. God, not distant from us, but God who has come to us to take us by the hand. This is the gospel. You and I have sinned against God, are separated from God, deserve eternal separation from him and judgment in hell. Yet God has come to us, not distant from us. He came to live among us, a life we could not live of no sin. And then even though Jesus had no sin to die for, he chose to die on a cross for whose sin? For our sin, he took our uncleanness upon himself, died on a cross, three days later rose from the grave so that anyone, anywhere, no matter who you are or what you have done, if you will turn from your sin and yourself and trust in Jesus, take his hand, he will cleanse you of all your sin and lead you into restoration with God for all of eternity. Amen. Uh, if you have never taken Jesus by the hand... Take him by the hand today. His hand is outstretched toward you right now. He's brought you here. In this room, wherever you are, online, other rooms, he's brought you here to see his hand reaching out in your life. He loves you, desires to heal you forever spiritually. Jesus is the physical, personal, tender compassion of God for all who trust in him. See his tender compassion. And then see his healing power. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, so yes, let's pause there. This is now the second time we've seen Jesus doing something like this. In Mark 7, you remember he spit and touched the tongue of a man with a speech impediment. 
Now he spits on the man's eyes, and we don't know why this was Jesus' preferred method. <laughs> I'm guessing if you were blind and a man spit on your eyes and you could see, you would be okay with that particular method. <laughs> so we don't know why, but clearly it was a picture of power in him providing healing in them. This is a picture of power in Jesus to provide healing in a man's tongue and his ears in that story and of a man's eyes in this story. And this is exactly what God had promised centuries before. In Isaiah chapter 35, verse 4 through 6, God had promised his people, he would come to them. Listen to these words. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. And we are seeing over and over again in the book of Mark, Jesus is the fulfillment of this promise. Where he goes, the eyes of the blind are open, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Now, we'll actually talk more about this next week, Lord willing, but the picture in this passage is clear. The healing power of God is present in Jesus, which means... There is no disability, disease, sickness, scar, hurt, or heartache that is beyond the power of Jesus to heal. Can I just say that one more time? There is no disability, no disease, no sickness, no scar, no hurt, and no heartache that is beyond the power of Jesus to heal. Amen. Fear not, all who have an anxious heart. Behold, your God will come to save you. Yes. Now, that leads the third characteristic of Jesus I want you to see in this story, his sovereign timing. And this is where things get really unique. Up until now, this story has been very similar to other healing stories. But this time, Jesus asks the man a question, something Jesus doesn't do in other healing stories. He asked him, do you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I see people but they look like trees walking. In other words, I can see, kind of, but it's blurry. People look like trees. Now, we don't know if this man was born with sight and became blind so that he knew what trees looked like, or if he was born blind and had felt trees, had a sense for what they may look like. The point is, his sight was incomplete. He wasn't completely healed. And this is the only time we see this happen in a miracle story with Jesus. So what does he do? Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. And he opened his eyes, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. The language here is basically saying his vision became perfect. From blurry to 2020, just like that, everything was clear. And Jesus sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. We'll talk more next week about why Jesus gave that instruction. And we'll talk about what Jesus was doing intentionally in this two-stage healing to teach his disciples about spiritual sight. But for now, let's just acknowledge that this man's healing was not instantaneous. It took time. And Jesus was sovereign over that timing. 
It's not like Jesus was thinking, oh, I didn't use enough saliva the first time. I mean, get some more. <laughs> Sorry, that was not in the notes. So what's happening? Jesus was able to do this the first time. And here we see that God has given us a story in the Bible to show us that sometimes healing takes time. And sometimes healing feels incomplete for a time. And sometimes healing doesn't happen the way we expect or the way we desire. But that doesn't mean Jesus is not compassionate. And it doesn't mean that Jesus is not powerful. It means that Jesus is working in ways we don't see in that moment. And we can trust what he is doing in that moment and in what he will do beyond that moment. And that's where this particular story is so helpful to us. Because inevitably, any picture of Jesus in healing inevitably leads to questions. Why do I have this disability or disease or sickness or struggle in the first place? Why have I experienced this hurt or this pain for which I need healing? And why won't God just take it away? If he loves me and if he has the power to do so. And think of people all across our church family who have all kinds of different struggles and have prayed for healing and it hasn't happened at least not in the timing we desire. Sometimes even leading to the loss of people we love a lot. And I can't answer those questions. None of us can this side of heaven. But we can know this beyond the shadow of a doubt. Until Jesus comes back, one day every one of us is going to succumb to sickness, struggle, weakness, and death. We will all breathe our last breath. But for all who trust in Jesus, in the very next moment, he will take your hand and personally lead you home, where he will, with his own hands, wipe every tear from your eyes, and he will heal you, mind, soul, and body, completely for all of eternity, for the next 10 trillion ages and beyond. These are light and momentary struggles. In other words, in whatever comes to your mind when you think of healing, you can trust the tender compassion, the healing power, and the sovereign timing of Jesus. So as I was reflecting on this passage, I started thinking about different ways that we see Jesus bringing healing in our church family. And many different pictures in our church family came to my mind. So before we pray together for healing in all kinds of ways, I want you to hear testimony of healing in one particular way. I want you to hear how Jesus is healing marriages among us. And I'll mention in a moment why marriages in particular are a powerful picture here. But I want to invite two couples to join me up here from our marriage ministry called Re-Engage. So 
In just a moment, you're going to meet Maurice and Irene and Justin and Allison. And together with them, I want you to get a glimpse of the tender compassion and the healing power and the sovereign timing of Jesus in healing that they have experienced. So will you welcome Maurice and Irene and Justin and Allison with me. All right, let's, let's start. Uh, maybe uh, Maurice and Irene, why don't you share just a little bit of you guys' story, background that led you to re-engage uh, the marriage ministry here at NBC. Thank you, Pastor David. Um, um, my name is Maurice Muchena, and this is my wife, Irene Kiraita. Um, we're both born and raised in Kenya, um, but have lived in the U.S. the last 24 years. We've been married for 22 years and have had lots of really, really beautiful, amazing years. But in there, we've also had some challenging times, um, you know, dealing with cancer, moving from the community that we were born and raised in and grew up in, and having to make new connections. Um, but those are moments that have given us an opportunity to live up to our vows. Um, these last couple of years have uh, been a, a little challenging, though, and um, that was reflected in uh, many ways, perhaps through how we were communicating with each other and uh, the ways in which we resolve conflict in our marriage. Um, at some point, we knew we needed to um, get some help. We just didn't know what that needed to look like. But by the grace of God, and thankfully, Irene had heard of uh, re-engage ministry um, as she attended Bible study, um, the women's Bible study at the McLean Bible um, Church. All right, we'll come back in just a minute. But to get a picture, Justin and Allison, tell us about the journey that led you guys to re-engage. Hey, hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Justin. This is Allison. So we've been married for 13 years. Uh, we have four children, 10, 8, 5, and 4. Uh, we're both from South Carolina. We're a military family. Uh, so we've been been around uh, the states for a while. And so uh, our marriage has been uh, difficult many years. And and the, the big thing is that there was a betrayal uh, on my part that happened. And uh, so that came to light in the summer of 2020. Um, and at that time, you know, we both talked about divorce or separation and I, I committed to being part of a, a group of men, and, and that was a year-long uh, effort. Uh, however, during that year, there was additional betrayal. And so this time last year, we were in the same home, uh, but separated. So, you know, I lived downstairs, and Allison was upstairs, and, and it was difficult. And, you know, literally on the verge of uh, uh, parting ways from each other, of divorce. And so... There was uh, a little positive progress on my part, but our marriage still, you know, uh, not moving forward. So we knew we needed something. Uh, we both had agreed that we did not want divorce, but that we were going to move, try and move forward together. And so it was kind of at that time that we heard uh, Ken and Judy Tucker's testimony, and that led us to reengage. So let's. We just heard about tender compassion in Jesus that brings healing. Allison, how have you experienced the tender compassion of Jesus in this journey? I remember in the hardest, like darkest times of our marriage, I just felt so lonely and anxious and sad. And I remember, I felt like God was telling me clearly that I um, needed to be faithful to him because the Lord is faithful to me. And it was just such a comfort. There was uncertainty and chaos, but it was a good reminder to just fix my gaze on Jesus, that he is kind, he can be trusted, he is good. Mm -hmm. What about you, Justin, in that process? Yeah, so, you know, for me, I had a lot of shame. Uh, I had hurt Allison, our marriage, our family. Um, I struggled with my faith. It was very much an, uh, like a roller coaster. It was very much up and down, you know, and, and it really was the compassion of Christ that led us to re-engage. Um, it kind of just came at the right moment. Um, you know, Christ never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Um, and, and it was his compassion that led us there, you know. And, and so to add on to that, you know, through Christ's compassion and through this ministry, you know, we've been able to, to relay a foundation of trust. 
um, that just kind of was not existent. Uh, you know, the house is not built, but, but, but there is a foundational layer of trust, and, and, and there's a lot of compassion in that. Hmm. I just want to make sure you're getting the picture in what Allison and Justin both shared, like the, the compassion of Jesus for you when you've been hurt some, by someone and the compassion of Jesus when you feel shame over something you've done, that the compassion of Jesus is sufficient for both of those hurts and for healing in both of those ways. The compassion of Jesus has so many tentacles in our lives. So, Irene, how have you seen the compassion of Jesus in um, this journey in your marriage? Well, uh, in Reengage, I saw that through the couples, uh, the couples that shared their struggles, their triumphs, and just seeing how uh, Christ restored their marriages. And, and what that did for me was it started um, uh, a softening of my heart. I started uh, being a little more compassionate with my husband. And, um, you know, I always thought that, you know, if he just communicated better or if he just, you know, gave me a little less feedback, you know, um, <laughs> I thought it would be great, but clearly that wasn't the way. But once I joined Reengage, by the second week, uh, really, by the second week, uh, I learned that I needed to stay in my circle, and I really needed to work on me and, the, and what I was bringing to the problems in our marriage. And, um, and just by knowing that Christ had such compassion for us and seeing the other couples and Him working in my heart, um, it started work on me, and the resentment started going away, and, and also watched my husband do the same, you know? We had a hard time figuring out where we were gonna get help, but once we started the re-engage program, he was also working in his heart. So the compassion he showed us to help us so, sh also show compassion for each other, um, that was just a blessing for us in this program. I love it, like, this was, uh... I'll tell you more about the ti timing of God and bringing this whole picture about, but uh, as I think about the tender compassion of Jesus, did you hear Irene just share how his compassion softened her heart and his compassion softened his heart? Like it's the compassion of Jesus that's creating compassion in us, that is healing us in ways that we don't even realize we need, but he does by his tender touch. So, uh, so, all right, tender compassion, healing power. Allison, how have you seen God's healing power in your marriage? Well, I echo what Irene says about re-engage. Every week, couples give their testimony, and it's such a beautiful reminder that God, um, God, Jesus, they continue to redeem these stories of brokenness. And specifically in our marriage, I've seen Justin grow in humility. He serves our family in love. He is worthy of my trust. He's changed so much, and I'm learning now um, to change too. I have some really controlling tendencies, and you know, Jesus is kind. He is able. He is good, and I can tr I can fully trust him that he you know he can work salvation and sanctification in Justin. I carried this burden for a long time of trying to make sure that Justin was making good choices, which is impossible and very heavy. And now I just feel lighter. And there was so much selfishness and anger and resentment on both our parts. And now there's peace and joy. We laugh together. There's unity and there's hope. I trust you're getting the picture. I mean, a year ago, they were on separate floors on a road to separation and divorce. And the healing power of Jesus is the only explanation for what we just heard. Uh, Maurice, how would you describe the healing power of Jesus? Yeah. So when I started re-engage, um, <clears throat> my heart was filled with resentment. Um, and I was harboring a lot of uh, that and uh, getting really frustrated with my wife. Um, but in re-engage, I learned about um, the brokenness of me as a human being. And uh, especially, you know, my inability to uh, learn perfectly, but in that also learn about God's perfect love. Um, that worked on me and has softened my heart. God's working on my uh, critical spirit 
And I've been able to uh, start seeing my contribution to our challenges a lot clearer. And um, you know, instead of um, um, being critical and uh, to my, towards my wife, just working on fixing um, my issues. And uh, as Irene said, also learning to stay in my circle and uh, working on myself instead of constantly blaming my wife. Healing power, not just in someone else, but in you. So sovereign timing, the sovereign timing of Jesus. Uh, Justin, what comes into your mind when you think about the sovereign timing of Jesus and what he's done in your marriage? Yeah, so, you know, like we already discussed, we were really at a point of either we're going to move forward together or we're going to, you know, we're going to separate, move in different directions. And, you know, we learned about re-engage and we really felt that uh, the Holy Spirit was prodding us and saying, hey, look, you need this. Uh, th this is your time. A and it was, you know. As, as David just said, like, th there's no explanation uh, for, for where we are today from where we were. And, you know, there were several sessions uh, as part of this ministry that were just really difficult and challenging, difficult topics that bring up resentment and anger, and, and we sh struggled to just make it through them. In fact, we didn't. We didn't make it through them. Um, but in God's time, you know, we are here uh, today to be able to speak to you about that and to, and to go through these difficult things. I would add, I would add one piece just to make the connection with something that Justin shared earlier. So uh, last summer, our church was walking through a really difficult time and um, some people were saying some things about uh, one of our elder nominees, Ken, who you heard mention, and uh, Ken and Judy shared their story one Sunday, um, and it was as Ken and Judy were sharing that story as a result of walking through challenges of church that Justin and Allison were sitting and heard, and just don't ever doubt the timing of God that he is doing things even when you don't understand why or what's happening. He's working in ways far beyond what you could imagine in those moments. To bring healing in lives and marriages and children, like, praise God. Uh, Maurice and Irene, how would you guys describe the sovereign timing of Jesus in all of this? Um, as Marisa said, we, we knew that we needed to uh, talk to someone to help us through our challenges in how we were communicating, uh, but we didn't uh, know what that looked like. Uh, the one thing that I was very uh, sure of, I needed it to be uh, Christian-based and Bible-based, but I also needed it to be uh, culture, from a culturally um, uh, attuned therapist. So, you know, we set on this journey to look for someone to do this, and it took well over a year. And I had known about re-engage over a year, and we talked about it, but we just kept on pushing it back. But for whatever reason, um, when it came to, I guess when time was, re time was ready for us, we just did. Um, and I'll have to say, even as we were going through, uh, you know, the signing up of re-engage for the open group, and then after that, there's the signing up of re-engage for the closed group, we're never really on the same page. You know, one of us was either, you know, one was 100% on and the other person was like, oh, I don't know. But deadline came and when, whenever the deadline was coming, we were able to sign up. And, and to, to, to this day, we can't quite say we've had so many God moments and just being able to sign up for re-engage was our first God moment. And, you know, even us being here, I mean, um, this, is, this is a lot for us. <laughs> And um, so just God being so uh, wonderful in pushing us to get the help when we needed it from where we needed it. So he mm -hmm. got us there. Yeah, it, it truly is God's work um, in us and a lot of prayer. Because when Irene first brought up the uh, idea of attending re-engage, I, I was not ready. And uh, I found a lot of different reasons why not to. Um, but, um, and, and she was very determined. So she was going to sign up with or without me. Um, and strange enough, um, <laughs> When the time came for her to sign up, um, I, I just happened to be passing by. She was, um, you know, uh, registering online, and she asked me, "Hey, um, I, I'm right. I'm, I'm registering. Are you are you done?" And I just said, "Yeah, sure. Um, sign me up." So, you know, we can only truly say that that was God's work in me. Um, whatever led me there. Um, and boy, am I glad that I did because, you know, while I had hesitations to probably go and uh, get vulnerable in a group setting. 
um, you know, when I got to re-engage, what I found was it was more than just a group setting, and it's really brought us closer together, brought us closer to God, and we are truly grateful for that. Praise God. So, sovereign timing one, I, I would be remiss if I didn't pause right here and say, I trust the Lord is leading some couples right now and is prompting some husbands and wives' hearts to say, we, we need to do this. And you don't have to be at a certain point or you don't have to be on separate levels of a house. Like, that's part of why just hearing from both these couples from different, so mclanebible.org slash classes, like go there, re-engage, all the information is there. I would encourage you, uh, trust the timing of God even in this moment in your life and your marriage. Um, Another note about the timing of God, uh, I asked these guys to share less than 24 hours ago. So just, just so you know, this was not, not planned yesterday at this time. These guys were enjoying a relaxing Saturday. And I woke up yesterday morning with this text on my heart and mind, and I, I had this idea. I'll mention why marriage in, in just a minute. But I called up Ken Tucker, who leads out of this ministry, one of our elders, and I said, hey, can you find a couple couples? And it just so happened that these two couples had just shared this last Wednesday night. And so their Saturday was interrupted by a call saying, hey, can you be on stage tomorrow in front of a couple thousand people sharing deep things from your life? And they graciously did. So would you give God glory with me for his grace in them? Thank you, guys. So here's why marriage in particular came to my mind. I had all kinds of needs for healing. But marriage came to my mind because it's an example of healing that just doesn't happen like that. Right? The journeys these couples have walked on, it hasn't been instantaneous. And these, this kind of healing takes time. And, and I just want us to lean in as we're about to pray for each other to the tender compassion of Jesus, the healing power of Jesus, and the sovereign timing of Jesus. And just to say together, we, we trust in you and to pray for each other in light of needs for healing in all of our lives, the same Jesus who did this in Mark chapter 8, the same Jesus who did this in these couples' lives is the same Jesus whose hand is outstretched toward you in your seat right now with whatever comes to your mind when you think about a healing. So would you bow your heads with me? I want to lead us into a time of prayer, and I, I want to do this in two stages, not to overdo the picture from this story, but Two stages, like first and foremost, I wanna ask you all across this room, other locations, online, first and foremost, have you experienced spiritual healing from Jesus? Have, have you asked God through faith in Jesus to cover over all your sins, forgive you of all your sins? Have you reached out your hand and said to Jesus, lead me as the Lord of my life. And if the answer to that question is not a resounding yes in your heart, then I invite you in the holiness of this moment just to pray right where you're sitting and say, God, I need you to heal me of my sin. Just to say to him in faith, I believe Jesus came and died on a cross for my sin, and he rose from the grave, and today I trust in him to cleanse me of all my sin and to lead me, lead me as the Lord of my life. When you say that to God, this is a picture of you taking the hand of Jesus in your life. He promises to save you as you trust in him and to lead you as you trust in him. In this moment, you can experience spiritual healing for all of eternity. 
And then, flowing from that, I want to pray for all kinds of other healing across this gathering. So in just a moment, if, if you would say, I need some healing in my life, maybe it's physical, maybe it's mental, emotional, maybe it's relational. If you would just say, I, I need some healing, then in just a moment, I'm going to ask you just where you're sitting to raise your hand before God, just between you and God. And to the extent with which you feel physically comfortable to do so, just to keep your hand raised as a picture of you saying, I need you to take my hand amidst my need for healing. And I just want to pray over you as our hands are raised all across this room, other rooms, online. So if you would say, yes, I need healing in my life, would you just raise your hand where you are and keep it raised to the extent which you can physically be comfortable, but to, as a picture of you saying, God, I need you, Jesus, I need your tender compassion, your healing power, trust your sovereign timing. So God, you see all these hands around this room, other Rooms where we're gathered online, all kinds of different places. You see these hands, you know the healing. Every single one of these people need, you, you know our need for healing better than we know our need for healing. We confess there are things we need healing for that we don't even realize we need healing for. They're so deep. Some are so obvious at the forefront. So for all of it, God, we pray. And I just intercede. Much like in this story, you have people coming to Jesus, begging for Jesus to touch them. God, I am begging for you to touch them, for your tender compassion all across this gathering. And every single one of these lives right now, that they would know they are loved by you, that they are seen by you that they are not alone, and that you are with them, that you are for them. You are not distant from them. God, may they know in this moment your tender presence with them, your compassion for them. And God, we pray for your healing. God, we boldly ask today for your healing in all kinds of ways. We trust you have power to instantaneously, right now, heal of disease. You have power to heal of disability. You have power to heal in, in intellectual, emotional ways, in relational ways. You have power to do that right now. We trust you do, God. And we would ask you to do it. In many of these circumstances, as many as possible, God, we ask, we desire that, please. At the same time we ask for that, we know that you are wise, you are good, you are loving, you are Father in heaven, you give good gifts to those who ask, and so we trust your timing. We trust your timing. And so if you choose in your wisdom to not heal in this way or that way at this time, then God, we say we trust in you. We want you more than we want to be healed. So we pray for strength and peace and joy and help in the waiting. We pray for wisdom to know how to walk in the waiting and faith in you. We pray for faith on days when faith is hard to come by amidst these struggles. We pray that you would do, just like we heard in these stories, all the work that's needed in each of our hearts in the middle of all of this. Draw us closer to you. Make us more like Jesus, we pray. Be strength in our weakness. Be joy in our pain. Be hope in the middle of our hurts. And Jesus, we sure look forward to the day when we will see your face and you will take our hands and you will wipe tears from our eyes and we will be healed completely. Jesus, we praise you for coming to us, for dying for us, for rising from the grave, for the guarantee that all who trust in you, not just wishful thinking, the guarantee that one day we will have resurrected bodies and minds and hearts, and we will be with you forever and ever and ever, that all of these struggles are light and momentary here compared to the surpassing eternal glory that is awaiting all who trust in you. We love you. We celebrate the hope we have 
have in you. And we pray that you would help us to make the good news known of the tender compassion, healing power, and sovereign timing of Jesus in this city and among the nations, among people with all kinds of needs around us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.